Great pleasure for me to introduce Professor Shuchi Chala from the other UW. Um, Shuchi has done beautiful work in algorithms, optimization, algorithmic game theory, and we're incredibly lucky to have her here for the year on sabbatical. Talking, today she'll talk about economics, optimization, and approximation. Thanks, Anna, and uh, thank you, CSE, for hosting me this year. I've uh, really enjoyed being here. Uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, economics and computing. And I want to start by addressing why you, as computer scientists, should care about economics. So over the last few years, uh, computing has increasingly moved uh, from the, away from the personal computer to the internet and the cloud. And uh, increasingly, instead of owning computing resources, we are uh, renting them or borrowing these resources. Um, and we are sharing them with millions of other users. And we care not so much about the system performance as much as we care about our own performance. So I care about my Netflix movie downloading as fast as possible uh, without paying attention to how it affects my neighbor's Skype call, let's say. So whenever we have this scarcity of resources and these resources are shared by uh, individuals that are selfish, economics comes into the picture. Okay. Now, in this talk, I'm going to uh, mostly focus on resource allocation problems and resource pricing. So let me start by describing a few different examples of settings where we might want to apply, uh, apply the kind of solutions I'll talk about. So first, let's talk about the internet. Um, and imagine that there's a customer, uh, could be a company or a university, that wants to uh, connect to the internet by connectivity from a service provider. Now, this customer uh, sees some kind of traffic pattern and wants to buy enough bandwidth that will support this traffic pattern. And this could be uh, something that varies over time. And of course, the customer wants to pay as little as possible uh, uh, to buy enough connectivity. The ISP, on the other hand, um, wants to figure out how to allocate these resources so that, on the one hand, the resource is utilized efficiently. On the other hand, uh, the service provider makes sufficient profits and might also uh, worry about things like where should capacity be added, um, you know, how to guarantee a certain uh, level of performance to the customers, and so on. Okay. Another example comes up in cloud computing. Here we might have a service that offers various different kinds of resources to customers. Um, so processing time, memory, bandwidth, and so on. And customers could have uh, different kinds of requirements. And sometimes uh, these resources can be traded off in complex ways. So let's say a customer requires uh, a certain number of CPUs, some amount of memory, and some amount of bandwidth, but will settle for fewer uh, processing units if he can get more memory. Okay? And the service provider has uh, a similar problem as before. You want efficient usage of the resources. In this context, you might want to guarantee some sort of fairness across the requests that you uh, receive. Different requests could also have uh, timing constraints. Some have deadlines, others don't have deadlines, but have some uh, precedence constraints over different tasks that their job could be divided into, and so on. So the, the thing to notice here is that the resource requirements are complex. There's uh, some complex language that describes what a customer would be happy with. And any kind of res resource allocation solution or pricing solution should recognize that and, uh, and balance that those needs. Finally, let's, uh, uh, let me pick an example from online advertising. So uh, imagine that uh, you are a search engine uh, and your basic stream of revenue is showing ads on search pages. Now, uh, note here, so here, this is an example from Google. And note that there are various different ways in which Google displays ads on their search pages. There are some um, sponsored links over here, um, right over here. 
and there are some sponsored links over here. And all of these are, um, uh, you know, ads, uh, all of these are slots on the web page that have different qualities or different properties associated with them. So to an advertiser, these slots might uh, bring different kinds of benefit. Okay, some slots may be more, uh, um, may have more value to the adver advertiser than other slots. Maybe the ones that come with a picture have more of a chance of being clicked than ones that don't, and ones that are farther down the list have uh, also a lesser chance of being clicked than ones that are, that are closer to the top. So uh, advertisers um, have these different uh, goals in mind. They want to reach uh, a large population. They want to reach the right demographic. Uh, but they also potentially have daily budgets, and they don't want to spend beyond these budgets. Okay, and the the search engine um, needs to balance the needs of the advertisers with their own needs, namely maybe revenue, uh, efficiency of some sort, and also with the needs of the user. So if the advertisements are not relevant to what is being searched for, then the users are not happy and don't cl uh, click on the links. Okay, so there are uh, different parameters that come into picture, and these uh, must be balanced together. So the field uh, in economics that deals with problems of this sort, optimization problems in uh, strategic settings, is called mechanism design. And it's best to understand what a mechanism is in the context of how it differs from an algorithm. So an algorithm, uh, it takes an input and maps it to uh, some desired output, a function that it wants to compute. A mechanism is similar, except it adds this layer of uh, dealing with strategic behavior on top of what the algorithm does. So a mechanism uh, deals with settings where the input is owned by uh, different participants who don't necessarily care about uh, so much about the specific output being computed, but their own objectives do depend on this output. And these participants may look at the behavior of the algorithm and use that to modify what the inputs are, report different inputs, so that it leads to um, a change in the behavior of the algorithm and produces something that's more desirable to them. Of course, from the point of view of the system designer or the algorithm, this is not desirable because you might not achieve what you set out to achieve. So mechanisms typically, uh, in addition to producing this output, also produce, also sometimes compensate or charge the participants for the output. And this in turn modifies the incentives of the participants and hopefully aligns them with those of the system designer. So for this reason, mechanism design is also sometimes called incentive engineering. Now there's a long and rich history of mechanism design in economics dating back to almost 100 years. Uh, a number of Nobel Prizes have been given out for work in mechanism design, uh, the most recent being in 2012. And th so the, this literature understands very well what sorts of functions we can implement in strategic settings and what functions we can't implement in strategic settings. But for the most part, it deals with small markets, few participants, few different kinds of resources, few parameters to deal with. And it focuses on describing or deriving exact solutions to the optimization problems that it studies. Computer science literature on mechanism design uh, has uh, started very recently. Uh, the first paper on the subject uh, appeared in 99. So there's a much shorter line of literature in computer science on this work. And there are several different challenges that the kinds of examples I described earlier bring up that are not adequately uh, addressed in uh, economics literature on mechanism design. And this is something that computer scientists are, uh, are trying to deal with and fill the hole here. So let me describe um, what challenges these new settings uh, uh, bring up. So first, as I said earlier, um, typically uh, in these very large scale computing systems, you have multiple different resources and these interact with each other in complex ways. And these are systems where we don't need to deal with 
four or five parameters, but thousands of parameters that need to be set. The consequence of that is the optimal solutions are typically quite complicated. They are, uh, of course, com computationally intractable to find, uh, but even if we found them, they turn out to be extremely complicated to implement or to even understand what's going on in there. Okay? And the consequence of that is the, the behavior of the participants or consumers that are trying to best respond to a certain system, that can be complex. Okay? And if we can't understand the behavior of the participants, we can't understand the behavior of the system. And if you can't understand the behavior of the system, you can't really design a system that achieves what you want it to achieve. Okay? So the computationally, it, it, computational intractability is an issue, and just the fact that the solutions are difficult to understand is also an additional issue. Furthermore, these systems, the optimal systems, tend to be quite finely tuned to what kind of market we are in or parameters uh, of the system, what kind of uh, initial state or constraints we are given. And if you tweak these a little bit, or if you imagine that the, uh, uh, the system designer does not have uh, perfect information about the market, then these mechanisms might not be robust to these changes. Okay. So for instance, imagine that uh, the market that Google works in, uh, the, uh, the, the kind of keywords that advertisers are interested in, or their inventories, or what sorts of users uh, search on Google's web pages, suppose all of these change over time, then it's quite possible that whatever optimal approach Google comes up with for selling ad slots, change over time. And it's unclear whether these changes would be easy to implement or uh, easy to, uh, to percolate through the system. And it would be desirable to have a system that's robust to small changes of this sort. Okay? So I'm going to argue that we can address all of these different issues through the lens of approximation. Okay. What do I mean by that? Well, uh, let's look at uh, a, a cartoon of this. So let's imagine uh, that there's the space of uh, all possible solutions to a certain uh, optimization problem, and our goal is to find the overall optimal solution in this space. Now, this space is unwieldy, and it's complex. And what we really want to do is to focus on a subspace of simple, robust, nice solutions. And we want to work with the uh, optimal solution in this class of nice solutions. Okay? And the question we're going to be asking is, how far is this optimal in class from the overall optimal solution? Okay? So on the one hand, we want this class of nice solutions to be small enough that they are simple and they have a bunch of uh, other properties. On the other hand, we want it to be expressive enough that the optimal in class is close to the overall optimal. Okay? And I'm going to illustrate through a toy example that it, this is in fact achievable uh, in many settings. Okay? So uh, any questions at this point before I proceed to some Map. <laughs> okay, good. Please interrupt me if anything is not clear. Okay, so uh, as I said, we're gonna now look at a toy problem, and this problem ignores all kinds of uh, practical issues. Uh, so uh, the point of the problem is to convince you that approximation can be interesting and practically useful. So the example that I'll talk about is uh, the problem of sell is selling something on eBay. So let's say that you are a seller uh, that has a large inventory of uh, luxury watches, and you want to open a store on eBay and sell these watches. Okay? So the question is that given your inventory and given what you know about the market, what selling mechanism should you use? Okay? Now, eBay already... Uh, provides a number of different options to its sellers. You can post prices for items and sell them at fixed prices. You can hold auctions. But in fact, big sellers don't just sell through eBay. They actually sell through various different uh, mechanisms. 
they may sell through Amazon, um, Google uh, has its own shopping service, and they might even sell through their own website. So these big sellers have a number of different mechanisms for uh, selling items. And the question is, how should they balance what they're doing on these different websites? How should they decide whether uh, uh, auctioning the item is the way to go, whether uh, setting fixed prices is the, is the way to go? And furthermore, um, on a website like eBay, what order should they show a consumer the, uh, the watches in? Watches that are close to the top, again, are more likely to be looked at uh, by the consumer. Watches that are down uh, the, uh, the list are less likely to be looked at. So what should you do? Okay. Um, and contrast this to the old-fashioned way before the internet, where what sellers did was to open a store, uh, put a price tag on every item, let consumers walk in, decide what they want to buy, and just leave the store with that. Okay. And the theorem that I'm going to present to you says that, in fact, this old-fashioned way is not much worse than the overall optimal way of selling uh, this product, regardless of how, how many different parameters you had uh, in order to maximize your revenue. Okay. It's always within a small factor of optimal. Okay. And the factor that we achieve is 31%, and I'll say a little more about that specific factor a little bit later. Uh, but what I'm going to do is uh, show you a proof of a slightly weaker statement. I'm going to show you uh, uh, that this old-fashioned approach can get an eighth of the optimal revenue. Okay. And the proof is simple enough that I'm going to be able to describe it entirely within the stock. Um, let me mention a few assumptions that we need for uh, the statement, uh, some of which can be removed. Uh, so first, we are going to assume that these consumers that are interested in buying the watches are drawn from uh, a single market uh, at random. Okay, so uh, there's some market, people uh, have preferences over how much they like the different watches, and every consumer that walks into the store is a random person drawn from that market. We're also going to assume that each consumer wants a single watch. These are luxury watches. Um, um, and we're going to assume that values for different watches are independent of each other. Okay? And these assumptions are going to be sufficient to give us this theorem. OK, so before we prove this theorem, uh, we're going to see some uh, simpler cases and understand those. So let's first imagine that the seller just has a single watch to sell, and there's a single consumer uh, drawn randomly from the market that uh, walks into the store. Okay, so what should the uh, seller do then? Well, it, so first of all, um, there's a, a theorem uh, in mechanism design that says that if you, have just, if you have just a single consumer and a single item, the only thing you can do in an incentive-compatible way is to uh, fix a price on this watch and then uh, let the consumer buy if he wants to pay this amount. Okay? You could try other things, but the consumer will always be able to manipulate the system so that it ends up being equivalent to this simple way of selling the watch. Okay? Okay. So now the question is, what should this price be? And in order to determine what this price should be, um, we can talk about what are called revenue curves. So a revenue curve just says uh, how much revenue the seller makes uh, by uh, posting any particular price on the watch. Okay? So in particular, the revenue curve is just um, uh, the revenue, if you post a price of P, is just this price times the probability that this consumer is going to be willing to pay this price. Okay, so that's the probability with which the consumer buys the watch and P is the price that he pays. Okay, so let's plot this as a function of price. And of course, we're going to need to specify what this probability of sale is. And uh, this is essentially coming from a demand curve that defines the market. Okay, at any particular price, what fraction of people want to buy the watch? Okay, and uh, of course, as the price, when the price is really small, Everybody wants to buy the watch. The probability of sale is one. When the price is really large, 
nobody wants to buy the watch. The probability of sale is zero. And we can take the product of these two and we can plot uh, the, uh, the product and that's the revenue curve describing this market for the watch that we are selling. Okay? And our question is, what's the optimal price to sell the watch at? And clearly, this is the price that achieves the maximum revenue, the maximum point on that curve. Okay? So simple enough. That's all that we need to do. But I'm going to go ahead and make a further assumption that's going to further simplify our life. And the assumption will be that the revenue curve looks nice and uh, rounded, okay? in particular, that it's concave. And this doesn't affect our discussion so far. Uh, we still pick the highest point on the curve, and that's the optimal price to set for the watch. But assuming, making this assumption is going to help us answer another related question, and that is the following. Um, so at this price P star, I have some probability with which I'm selling the watch. Now suppose I wanted to really, really retain the watch with a higher probability. I wanted to sell it with a smaller probability. What price should I set for the watch then? So suppose I had in mind a probability Z, and I wanted to sell the watch with no more than a probability of Z. Then what's the best thing to do? Well, this revenue curve makes it quite easy to answer that question. You should just pick the price at which uh, the probability with which the uh, uh, consumer wants the watch is exactly Z. Okay? Note that as you lower the probability of sale, this price goes up, and uh, for any particular Z, you always want to be selling with, that, uh, with probability exactly Z, as long as uh, this price point is uh, more than the optimal price that I showed you on the previous slide. Okay? So, uh, so that's all that we are going to need to understand about revenue curves. And now let's move to a more interesting setup. Okay? So let's say now that we again have a single watch to sell, uh, but now there are multiple people interested in this watch. Okay? And they're all drawn from the same population, uh, but they're going to be willing to pay different amounts for this watch. Okay? And in fact, let me summarize uh, how much they're willing to pay for this watch by uh, these values, uh, V1, uh, V2, et cetera. So each such value tells us how much the corresponding consumer, uh, what is the maximum price that this consumer is willing to pay for the watch, OK? OK. Um, but of course, we don't know these values. If we knew these values, then we could just charge the person with the highest value precisely that amount, and that would be great. But we don't know these values. So what can we do? Well, so in this case, what the optimal mechanism looks like is the following. So again, it's going to set a price for every person. So uh, this person 5 here is going to be offered the watch at some price P5. And this price is going to be a function of the values of other people. Okay? So if other people are willing to pay a really large amount for the watch, then we will offer the watch at a high price to the fifth guy. If other people are not really interested in the watch, then we might offer the watch at a lower price to the fifth guy. Okay? So this price could be a function of these values. Okay? But these functions can be pretty complicated. And that's what I mean by saying that the optimal mechanism uh, the optimal system can be complicated. We don't understand very well what these optimal price functions look like. If we can, even if we can derive them, uh, they could have some complicated rules in there. Uh, if the first person's uh, value is at least uh, uh, twice the second person's value, then charge the fifth person three times the first person's value, and so on. Could have rules like that, and that's that's strange. That's just strange to do. Okay, so we want to do something simpler. So what we are going to do is uh, run the following thought experiment. Okay, so let's think about. Uh, so let's imagine that we knew what this optimal mechanism did, and we're going to summarize its behavior through um, uh, through some uh, a simple sequence of numbers. And these numbers are just going to tell us the probabilities with which each of the people are going to get the watch. Okay, 
So let's say that uh, person one gets the watch with probability Z1, person two with probability Z2, and so on, under the optimal mechanism, okay? Now, let's simplify the life of the seller, and let's say that the seller now has multiple copies of the watch, but the seller cannot sell to these people with probabilities more than what are given by the ZIs, okay? So the seller can sell multiple copies of the watch, but must respect these probabilities. So he can, if the values of, if everyone has really, really high values, the seller could decide to sell three watches instead of just one, okay? Okay, so now that we have uh, that in place, well, uh, when the seller is selling to person one, he need not worry about the values of other people. He need not worry about how much other customers want this watch. He can focus just on person one. There are no other constraints that stop the seller from selling to person one, okay? Other than the fact that he cannot sell with probability more than Z1, okay? The presence of other consumers does not affect what the seller should do with this consumer, okay? Because he has an unlimited supply of watches, okay? What that means is that for each person here, the seller should just set, uh, should just look at the revenue curve uh, as we discussed earlier and set these optimal prices uh, given by the P star function, like I described earlier. The point is that these prices depend only on the probabilities, ZI, and not on uh, other people in the system. So now these prices are independent of what other consumers walking into the store look like, okay? Okay, so that's great. So we've uh, taken the optimal mechanism. Uh, just by giving it a larger supply of watches, we've made it simpler. And furthermore, we've increased the revenue of this mechanism, okay? So by having a larger supply, this optimal mechanism has more flexibility of doing what it wants to do, and so can obtain a larger revenue, okay? The conclusion from this thought experiment is that the optimal revenue with just a single watch can be no more than the revenue that the mechanism obtains when it has this unlimited supply. And what is that revenue? Well, from each person, uh, we sell at this price of P star of ZI, and the person accepts with the probability uh, ZI. And so you take the product of those and you sum over all of the consumers, and that's the revenue that the mechanism gets in expectation, okay? So that's great. So we don't understand what the optimal mechanism looks like, but we know that its revenue can be no more than this quantity that uh, I, I'm showing there. Okay, okay, good. So what can we do with this? Okay, so we can't just set these prices uh, if we have only one watch because we don't have an unlimited supply, we just have one watch. So we wanna do something different, but at the same time get revenue that's close to the sum up there, okay? So how can we do this? Well, what we're gonna do is we're going to increase the prices thereby reducing the probability with which consumers are gonna buy the watch, okay? So in particular, let's set the sale probabilities for each person I to be one half of what it was in our thought experiment, okay? And correspondingly, the price uh, goes up. Recall from the revenue curve that as you decrease the probability of sale, the corresponding price that you set for the item goes up, okay? Okay, good. Um, but even with decreasing these probabilities, it could still be the case that uh, multiple people uh, want to buy the watches at these prices. And we only have uh, uh, one watch to sell, okay? So what do we do then? Well, we're gonna do something extremely simple. We're just gonna give it to the first person that comes and claims his watch at that price, okay? Okay, so what does this do to our revenue? Well, um, so that's the pricing up there again. So the, the important question to ask is, when person I shows up, what is the probability that we haven't yet sold the watch? Okay? Okay, so note that 
person one bought the watch with probability z1 over 2, person two bought the watch with probability z2 over 2, person three with probability z3 over 2, and so on. And if we sum all of these up, up to person i, that's the, the most uh, probability with which we've already sold the watch. Okay. So what is that probability? Well, let's recall where the zi's came from. Those were just the probabilities with which the, the mechanism in our thought experiment was selling the watches, okay, the optimal mechanism when we did the thought experiment. It was selling uh, watches to these guys with the probabilities given by the zi's. Okay? So in particular, the sum of these zi's is just one. The watch goes to one person. They can't uh, the, all get, uh, get it at once. Okay? So when we divide these probabilities by two, the most they can sum up to is one half. Okay? Okay, so when person I shows up, the most probability with which we might have already given away the watch is just one half. We still have the watch with one half probability. Okay? So person I is going to be offered the watch with one half probability. He's going to accept the, the high price at which we are selling the watch with probability zi over two. And if that happens, then we get the price at which we were selling the watch. Okay? And if you put all of that together um, and pull the two one halves out of the sum, we get that this total quantity is at least a quarter of the bound that we had through our th thought experiment on the optimal revenue. So what's the implication? The implication is that there's some setting of prices that we can offer uh, for this watch to the, the customers so that, the first, so that if we sell the watch to the first person that claims the watch at the corresponding price, then our revenue is no worse than a quarter of the optimal thing that you could have done uh, with this much more complicated approach of uh, uh, maybe auctioning the watch or, uh, or you know, selling it through different venues and so on, okay? So that's the, uh, that's the first uh, non-trivial result. Any questions at this point? Yeah. Why do you have to do a half? Okay, good question. So all we wanted to balance was uh, we still want these people to accept this watch with good probability. And all we want to make sure is that uh, there is sufficient probability that we haven't sold the watch so far. Okay. And, and uh, dividing by two turns out to be just the perfect thing to do here, balances the two things. Okay. But this analysis is not tight, and in fact, you can show that this, is, this gets half of the optimal revenue by just the right setting of prices. And another thing I want to point out here is that uh, I mentioned earlier that we can assume that all the consumers are random people drawn from a single population. And when that happens, the demand curves of all of these consumers are identical. And what that means is, first of all, the optimal mechanism is going to be equally likely to sell to each of these people. So the ZIs are going to be the same. And these P star functions are also going to be the same for everyone. Okay? The implication being that, in fact, we're offering the watch at the same price to everybody. Okay? So that's just like displaying the watch in a store at some fixed price, not worrying about who shows up, and then just selling it to the first person that wants to buy it. Okay. All right, so um, let me go on to another interesting special case before I describe the result in the full generality. And this is when you have a number of different watches to sell, uh, but you only have one consumer show up in the store, okay? Okay, so now this consumer wants to buy just one watch, but has different values for different watches. So might like one more than another. And any mechanism in this case, any selling mechanism is going to have the following form. It's going to set prices on these watches. And then the consumer is going to look at the watches that he's still interested in, namely those where his value is more than the uh, price on the watch. And of these, he could pick some favorite one, okay? 
we don't know we don't necessarily know how the consumer makes the decision of which one of these watches to buy he buys one of them and we get the corresponding price okay and the question is how should we set these prices okay now again this mechanism is a simple enough mechanism uh, but we don't understand the behavior of the optimal solution at all computing the optimal set of prices is computationally hard and there's no good way no formula for describing uh, what these prices should be no concise way of describing what these should be okay so again we want to come up with a simple approach uh, or uh, a simple solution that is nevertheless close to optimal and we're going to do that by uh, analogy to the setting that i just described namely where you just have one watch and you have many people interested in this watch okay and why are these two situations similar well for one the input output behavior of the optimization problems is very similar so in the the case of a single consumer this consumer has different values for the different watches and you're going to hand him one watch at some price in the second case you have four different consumers with uh, four different values for a single watch and you're going to hand the watch to one of them okay so similar input similar output behavior uh, but of course the situations are very different in terms of what the participants want how they're going to behave and so on and to relate them better let me change the second situation a little bit and let's say that we still have four different watches but each of these consumers is just interested in one of them so the first one is just interested in the first watch doesn't want anything to do with the other three the second one's just interested in the second watch and so on okay and furthermore imagine that these different consumers in the second setting are really representatives of the guy in the first setting okay so so the this first guy sends his four of his friends to go to the store and uh, do his bidding for him okay and since they're all representing the same guy they're going to collude among themselves and uh, you know figure out the best way to get him what he wants okay now contrast this to the situation that we had earlier where we have we had multiple different consumers and they were in some sense competing against each other they didn't care about the other guy they just wanted to uh, do the best thing for themselves now um, so we'll call these guys representatives and uh, one of the things that you can note here is if the representatives collude that hurts the seller okay uh, any kind of uh, cooperation is going to be against the seller um and to the benefit of these consumers so in particular we can note that in this setting here where we have a single consumer and which is the same as having four different consumers that are colluding with each other is worse for the seller than the setting where you have four different consumers competing against each other and we already know uh, for the four different consumers competing against each other we already know how to bound the revenue that the seller gets from them okay so we can basically use the same bound here um and we can basically use the same approach here for setting prices on the watches so before we set prices on the watches and we let the first consumer that wanted uh, the, the watch uh, to uh, leave with the watch here again we are going to set prices on the watches and we are going to let this consumer pick whichever watch he wants and the prices are once again going to be derived from these probabilities zi that we get from our thought experiment with four competing consumers okay and once again what happens is we get a set of prices that if we offer to this uh, consumer and let him pick whatever he wants is going to give us a, a, a is going to be a factor of 4 uh, at most away from the best revenue that we could achieve from any setting of the prices okay so i described to you the special case where you have many consumers one uh, watch to sell or if you have one consumer and many watches to sell 
And now I want to convince you that the same approach pretty much can be applied when you have many consumers and many watches to sell. Okay? And once again, the key is to doing this thought experiment where we replace every consumer by his representatives that are each interested in just one of the watches. Okay? And then if we allow them to compete and look at what the, the sale probabilities in the optimal solution look like, that gives us a, a bound on how much revenue the overall best mechanism can get from the setting. Okay? And now we just take those probabilities and we raise the corresponding prices a little bit. We lower these sale probabilities, we raise the corresponding prices. And then we argue that if you look at any particular consumer and if you look at any particular watch, with high probability, nobody is going to hinder this consumer from being able to buy this watch. Okay? So two things could happen. Either this consumer could become interested in some other watch, okay, or somebody else could be become interested in the same watch. And both of those could preclude this consumer from buying the green watch. Okay? And all we want to do is to bound the total probability of any of those things from happening. Okay? And by lowering these z's that we computed before by a factor of four, we can argue that this total probability from coming from this column and from this row is going to be at most uh, of uh, one half. Okay? So once again, it's going to be the case that there's nothing else stopping this consumer from buying this watch uh, with probability at least one half. And so with that probability, we're going to be able to offer the watch to this consumer at uh, a certain price, and the consumer is going to accept with the zij over 4 probability. Okay? And we can put all of this together. We can pull out the factor of 8. And what this gives us is, uh, uh, it, this shows us that uh, essentially this old-fashioned pricing, where we just put a price on every watch and uh, sell it to whoever wants to buy it on a first-come, first-served basis, this gets us uh, within some factor of optimal. And the factor that I just showed you is a factor of 8, uh, but we can do a better analysis to show that we can get 31% of optimal. Now, any questions at this point? Okay, so I know some of you are thinking this and not asking. Um, you know, do you ser seriously think that a seller is going to just give up 70% of his revenue when they could, in fact, achieve all of it through a different mechanism? But that is the key. The optimal mechanism is something that you just cannot hope to implement in practice. We never see optimal uh, complicated mechanisms in practice. What we see all the time are these pricing-based mechanisms. Pricings, simple auctions, and so on. And why is that? That is precisely for the kinds of reasons I mentioned before. Uh, behavior of consumers and sellers is hard to predict when you have a complicated system in place. It's not robust to things like collusion, changes in the market, uh, you know, misestimating demand curves and so on. Whereas the kind of mechanisms uh, that I described, uh, you know, pricing-based mechanisms tend to be much more robust to these issues. Okay? But then why should we compare against the overall optimal mechanism at all if it's, uh, uh, you know, this bad solution that nobody's uh, going to be interested in? Well, because it gives us a way to figure out uh, precisely what is a good class of simple mechanisms that we should be interested in. There could be many different ways of describing a simple, nice class of solutions. What is the right one to do in practice? And thinking about how close to optimal it can bring us can be a good way of distinguishing between different approaches for the same problem. Okay. So uh, before I conclude, I quickly want to mention some extensions. Uh, as I said, uh, I described a toy problem, uh, and there are ways in which we can extend these solutions to more general settings. Uh, and there are other extensions that we don't understand very well yet. So this is a very active and interesting field of study. 
Um, so first, we can handle general resource constraints, uh, a large class of general resource constraints. We can handle settings where the seller is selling in multiple different markets. Here I talked about consumers being drawn randomly from a single market. You can uh, deal with consumers that come from different markets, have different attributes. Um, there's an interesting aspect here, which is that mechanisms can sometimes uh, give, uh, sell lotteries to consumers, lotteries of the form that if you pay a certain amount, you are not certain of getting uh, the, the item. With some probability, you get this item. With some probability, you get a different item. You might buy from, uh, let's say, Priceline, a hotel room in Miami, and with some probability, it could turn out to be a hotel close to the beach with some probability on the other uh, end of the city. And consumers like bargains of this sort. So can, can these uh, bargaining mechanisms, can they uh, help improve the seller's revenue? And it turns out that they can. Okay. Likewise, sometimes it helps to sell multiple items together in a bundle at a certain discount. So if you go to Amazon, buy a book, sometimes they recommend two other similar books that you can buy all three together. And uh, bundling items in this manner can sometimes improve the seller's revenue also. Okay. Um, th you can have consumers with budgets. Uh, this often happens in the context of online advertising, and then the mechanism needs to take those budgets into consideration and make sure the consumers are not overspending. Um, and this can also be handled with the kinds of approaches I described. Um, there can be several other objectives. I focused on revenue. Uh, some of these objectives we understand very well. Uh, uh, economic efficiency is something that's been uh, extensively studied. Other objectives like fairness, we don't understand so well yet. And this is a topic of ongoing research. Um, values uh, of different consumers being correlated, drawn from the same sources of information, um, understanding, learning these demand curves, many competing sellers in the same market, these are all different kinds of issues that are, again, topics of current research and are topics that, uh, extensions that we don't understand very well yet uh, and are very interesting uh, uh, topics of study. Okay, so I want to conclude with a few uh, thoughts for you. Uh, economics is becoming increasingly important in computer science as we move towards this uh, model of collective computing. And computational approaches at the same time are becoming important in economics as economic systems themselves uh, become large scale. And this is a time of great opportunity for us as uh, computer scientists and uh, algorithm designers to export some of our ideas like approximation, analogy uh, to economics and help solve some intractable problems there. Thank you. Any questions? Yeah. So you had the example that you got 31% or whatever. Is, is there a way of saying, well, that's the best you can do by some simple mechanism, uh, you know, relative to art or? Right, so in some cases, uh, we do have examples where that show a gap. Uh, the gap examples we have currently don't have very large gaps. So um, uh, gaps somewhere between one and two uh, are something we know of. Uh, so even in the setting where uh, you have uh, a single, uh, where uh, you have a bunch of consumers and a single item, and what you want to do is this sort of sequential selling mechanism, uh, we have gaps there that are uh, close to 1.5, if I recall correctly. Uh, but we don't really have gap examples that go beyond two. So it's quite possible that the analysis here can be uh, improved. Although in settings with many items and many consumers, I'd be surprised if uh, it were possible to bring the gaps down to something very small. Yeah. Okay, well, let's thank you again. Thank you.